You're listening to TIP. On today's show, we sit down with Andreas Ramos, who moved to Silicon Valley in 1992, where he worked in engineering at SGI, Sun Microsystems, Rio, IMSI, and other companies, where he did translation and localization, and then led global SEO at Cisco. On today's episode, you'll learn... Will Google and some of these monster tech companies hold their lead in the future? Which companies are recruiting the best engineers? And what technology sectors might be areas to keep an eye on in the future? This and much more on today's episode of Silicon Valley. You are listening to Silicon Valley by The Investors Podcast, where your host, Sean Flynn, interviews famous entrepreneurs and business leaders in tech. Discover how money is made in Silicon Valley and where tech is going before it gets there. Andres, thank you for taking the time today to be on Silicon Valley. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Andres, you told me stories about sitting in the same office as Craig from Craigslist. You have such a history here in the Valley, and you've seen companies come and go. But can we just find out a little bit more about yourself and your background up till now? Sure. Back in 85 or so, when Microsoft DOS came out, IBM developed the first PC. I bought one to write my thesis. I was working on a doctorate in philosophy. And these were a much better way of writing than with a select your typewriters. So I bought a PC and learned how to program, began working with computers, uh, making software, selling software that grew really fast. In 92, I came to Silicon Valley to work in more computer companies. From 92 till now, though, give us a little bit of information. When I came back in 92, it's, it's really hard to imagine today. There was so little here. Palo Alto was a small, sleepy town. 237 freeway was a two-lane blacktop road going through fruit fields, orchards, 280 freeway, hardly anybody on it. A car would be a, a mile ahead of you, about a car a mile behind you. It's just basically nobody here. The company were small. Uh, we all thought, okay, this is fun. We never thought it would become bigger than this. There was a guy, we got, we started building the first websites. They came out and we thought, oh, this is cool. You can see pictures on the web. And so, of course, we put pictures of our, our girlfriends and our cats on the, <laughs> the first website. This kid at Stanford in his dorm room began collecting websites. Every time we found a new website, we would send it to him. So Jerry started making a list of links. That was Jerry Yang from Yahoo. Uh, so we all knew each other. We all emailed back and forth. Then later, I went to work at SGI. That was the people nowadays, they go to the Google campus. They see all these giant buildings everywhere. That all used to be SGI. They built all of that. Then SGI collapsed a few years later. Google found these abandoned buildings and moved in. Then after that, I worked at a startup here near Great America, and I shared this large cube with this other guy who was a really intense engineer. <laughs> Let's put it that way. He was so intense, upper management hated him. He was so good, they didn't dare fire him. They tolerated him. And that was, of course, Craig from um, Craigslist, Craig Newmark. So I was working on my projects. We were working really intense, work 10 hours a day, 15 hours a day, and late at night, there would be food. And then I would work on my projects, and he would work on his projects, and I would help him out with his stuff, and he would help me out with my stuff. And his friends from his high school up in Napa said to him, hey, Craig, we want to sell stuff online, like uh, bicycles, like a yard sale. Could you build something for that? And Craig said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll make some kind of list for that. And that's how it started. And he built that in, at that startup at night on his own. And we would look at the code and figure out, fix things and make things. And then Craig. From that, it grew and grew and grew. And today, I think he makes something like $100 million a year in personal income from Craigslist. He's not the CEO either. He's the, um, he works in technical support at Craigslist, actually. So you've seen companies come and go in your time here in Silicon Valley. You'd mentioned SGI. What makes a company succeed? What are some stories that you have? Because most people at home, when they think Silicon Valley, they think, Success. They think all these people driving around and now Teslas or McClellans or these fancy cars, but a lot of people forget that these Titans come and go pretty quickly in the valley here. It's amazing how much it changes here, how quickly it changes. Their cycles that last basically around two or three years. Companies start, grow super fast, and then collapse really quickly. And that's because of technology itself. 
This is what engineers learn to do. This is what engineers optimize. The people outside of Silicon Valley, outside of engineering, they don't really understand that. They think optimize means make it a little bit better. No. A company starts, Sean, you develop a new, a new process for doing something. And it becomes really big. And now you have a huge company and so on. Other engineers, they can't compete against you because you have the technology. You've developed that. The only thing they can do is make it better, which means using Google's slogan, smaller, cheaper, or faster. If they can come up with some way to make it 10 times smaller or 10 times cheaper or 10 times faster, then they can kill your company. So that's what engineers do. They, they develop, they optimize the software, the hardware to make it better. That comes out and the old company, which means two years old, basically collapses because the entire market moves over to the new system, which is 10 times smaller, cheaper, or faster. Do you have any examples from your time here of companies that you could talk about where it was kind of obvious the technology was changing and then maybe they just didn't catch up? Oh, SGI is a really great example. Silicon Graphics, SGI, was the mega company of the time. Uh, it was the, they built the chips that go into every graphics uh, machine, every, every kind of animation, movies, all that. Toy Story was all developed using HGI chips, and it was all built on Unix. At the time, the Unix engineers truly believed they knew in their bones Unix was the optimal operating system, far better than anything else. So they built everything for Unix. But the guys up in Seattle with Microsoft came out with Windows, and of course, the first versions of Windows were not very good, but they kept making it better better and better. But the Unix people ignore that because they use Unix. Nobody would be caught dead using Windows. But Microsoft kept making it better. And at XGI, we would do processes or things we had to do. We began realizing it was impossible to do it on an XGI machine. An XGI computer cost $30,000 to do web development, which was crazy. You could buy a $3,000 PC that could do it better. XGI insisted, $30,000 machines. We had to do work on these machines and we realized it was faster to do it on a window machine. So we put the work on diskettes, take it home, and do it at home all night, and bring it back the next day, and then present it at SGI. This went on for a year. The engineers kept refusing to use Unix, and then that came to the end. The market simply moved away from SGI $30,000 machines, and all went over to Windows PCs that were really cheap then. With stories like this and experiences, are you seeing similar patterns right now with companies here in the Valley? Oh, yes. What happens? These companies become really big. The first two years, they grow really quickly. Then they get to several thousand employees or more. They start becoming bureaucratic. There's a lot of process. There's layers of management. Anything done, you have to navigate through a, a minefield of, of bureaucrats, of, of company politics and bureaucracy and so on. That slows every process down. Instead of building a web page, Look, really honestly, Sean, you and I could knock together a 30-page website in a weekend. It's that easy to do. We can do that quickly. But when I work with these large companies, billion-dollar companies, it takes up to nine months to reproduce a 30-page site because every vice president, every director in the company wants to put their hands and make decisions about colors and fonts and this and that. It becomes an endless process of bureaucracy and having to deal with all that. So it becomes really hard to do anything. At the same time, the company ossifies. It settles down into the technology they know, the processes they know, and they stop looking at other new technologies because they were successful two years ago to so keep on doing the same thing. But they simply don't look outside and realize that other companies are doing things smaller, cheaper, or faster. So are there any companies in particular right now you're looking at that you think there's some competition growing or you see competition out there that you think might lead the market sometime soon? The best example to, I, I can think of right now is uh, Google. Google developed search technology back in 1999 based on counting links. The more links you had, the higher your score. That worked really well until about 2002 or so when the spammers realized all they needed was lots of links. So they began bombarding Google with links. By 2006, Google realized they had to have something different. So they started using people to evaluate websites. Humans, 10,000 people looking at websites. They developed machine language tools to evaluate websites, and that worked really well. By 2009 or so, Google basically solved the problem of search. From 2009 to 2012, there just simply tweaks on that, minor adjustment improvements. Google pretty much stopped developing 
after 2009. What you see today is very much the same from oh, t 10 years ago now. Google then became the mega search engine and is really good at indexing pages. It indexes roughly around 130 trillion pages. That's trillion with a T. So if you're looking for, for example, Sean Flynn here, you can find one page about him, but you don't find all the other pages about him and how they relate to him. You don't find out where he went to school, all of that. You don't really get much of that. You simply find the search results. Faced with that problem, LinkedIn began figuring out they had to do something better about search. So again, optimize smaller, cheaper, faster. LinkedIn began building their own machine learning algorithms and their own teams of 5,000 humans to evaluate pages. So now if I want to look for someone, Sean Flynn, I can find him in LinkedIn much better and get a great deal of information about him. LinkedIn has a tool called Sales Navigator, which most people don't know about, but you pay $80 a month, you get Sales Navigator, and now I can see all the people who are connected to Sean. I can see where he went to school, all the jobs he's had before, and where he works at now, all the things he's doing, news releases about Sean. I can see a score about him, how significant he is. So LinkedIn is a better search tool for finding people. It only indexes 600 million people, but here I can find investors, connections, clients, customers, staffers. I can use LinkedIn as a far better people search engine than Google. The same thing going on with many other tools. For shopping, for example, Amazon is a far better shopping site than Google. If I want to buy something, I go to Amazon. One click, I buy it. Amazon advertising now is becoming really growing really quickly. Instagram has turned into a shopping site, or better said, a travel site. People see all sorts of places they want to go to. The worldwide popular tourist destinations have become swamped with people because people see it in Instagram, they go there. Instagram has a tremendous opportunity to build a travel service. You see the site, you buy the ticket. Pinterest has turned into a huge shopping site. Women go on Pinterest, it's 80% women. They see dresses and picture frames and all sorts of things for the house, and they can click on it and buy it directly from printers. Because Google is so big, these smaller sites have figured out a better way to search for things on their sites. So you're seeing a fragmentation of the search market being taken away from Google. So is this similar like Craigslist, how all these startups decided to take one little item from Craigslist and make it into a company, but instead now all these companies are taking one page from Google and making that into a company? Exactly. Because Google is so large, it's so dominant, the smaller companies look at what they can do. They cannot compete against Google. It would be, it would be a waste of time to try to start a new search engine. So instead, look at pieces of Google and figure out how to do it smaller, cheaper, or faster. Do you think any of the other search engines, DuckDuckGo or Internet Explorer or Firefox, will have a chance against them in the coming years? Ooh, look, folks, I love DuckDuckGo. That's my primary search engine. I really like uh, DuckDuckGo, but it has no chance of competing against Google because Google has established itself as the company for the brand. When you think of hamburgers, McDonald's owns hamburgers. They own the concept of hamburgers. You think of running shoes, Nike owns running shoes. The same thing with search. Google simply owns the concept. So it's impossible for an outsider to come in and compete against Google. Not going to happen. All these websites, you first have to go to Google to search to get to LinkedIn. Is it going to change in the future where maybe you just always stay on LinkedIn and use other websites connected with it? Or are you always going to go back to your homepage, your Google? People are using Google when they're searching for things. But they're also using the other tools. They're not going to Google to search LinkedIn. They're going directly to LinkedIn and using Sales Navigator at LinkedIn. I don't think there's a way to go from Google to Sales Navigator. So they're using the LinkedIn tool to search in LinkedIn. They're going to Instagram. I read yesterday morning that uh, Facebook traffic has dropped 26% in the last year. In one year, that's a tremendous drop. And a lot of people say, oh yeah, Facebook is collapsing. No problem. Mark Zuckerberg sleeps quite well at night because Facebook owns Instagram. What's happened is that the young people, the 13, 14 year olds to the 24 year olds have simply migrated away from Facebook over to Instagram. So whether they're in one end of the room or the other end of the room, they're still within the Facebook empire. 
So that's fine for Facebook itself, for Facebook the corporate side. So people are using these other sites to do things. They're going to Pinterest to look at things for the house. They're going to Instagram to look at location sites and things like that. Andres, you have this huge social media background. What do you see as the future for social media marketing and advertising? Is there going to be disruptions in the industry? Oh, yeah. Social media, again, bumped along trying to figure out what it is. It sounds really odd. When it first started in 2002, 2004, it was called Web 2.0. They found that you could use Java and JavaScript and all sorts of Ajax to to make interactive web pages. That slowly became social media. When Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook, he didn't really know what he had. And a year or two later, when he left Harvard and came to Palo Alto, he lived about two or three blocks from our house. He came here with four or five people from Facebook, as he called it back then. And they said, okay, now we're in Palo Alto. Now we're going to stop wasting our time with this Facebook nonsense and start a real company. (laughs) And they really were going to abandon Facebook. But the investors kept saying, no, 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 stay with Facebook, grow that instead. And so they kept plugging at it and it grew. But they didn't really understand what they had. People began asking, please make an app for it. And Mark Zuckerberg heard it said, no, we're not going to put it on mobile. It doesn't work on mobile. And for a long time, they kept saying, we're working on a better experience for mobile. We meant we're not going to do it. But when 2009, the iPhone came out and there's tremendous pressure to be on mobile, Facebook said, okay, okay, we'll make an app. They made an app. It exploded from there. 80% of the traffic now is through mobile. And that drive was now called the, the social mobile web. It's totally different from before them. Facebook did not plan this. They had no idea what was going to happen. They simply bumped into it. The same thing with uh, advertising. Sheryl Sandberg and others built the advertising engine at Facebook. It was a disaster for the first six years. In 2012, a few engineers rebuilt the ad engine and finally started working. And then Facebook started making money. But again, they didn't plan that. They didn't really understand how it worked. In the last few years, now we're going to the, the next phase. And it's no longer social media. Now it's social marketing. If you have 10,000 followers or more in Instagram, then Instagram lets you set up a business site at Instagram. Now you can start selling stuff. And that means products, catalog, payment system, transactions, shipping, all that is built into Instagram. Same thing with Pinterest. So these sites now are realizing instead of making money on advertising, they can make money on the sales of products. So what you're seeing is a evolution from social media into social marketing. Jennifer has a new pair of high heel shoes and her friends see that and they want to buy that and so on. People see from each other what they have. Uh, Laura takes a, a ski vacation to Denver, great ski resort. Her friends see that, they want to go there. That's a new opportunity to, there, to sell tickets, travel plans and so on. Are there any changes in revenue for Google ads or these companies that are selling ads on, on their platforms? Oh, yeah. Let's go, to the, um, let's go to the blackboard here, to the whiteboard, and let's draw a graph here. So back in 2002, when AdWords started, you have this line that slowly starts growing. By 2004, 2005, it spikes upward. You have this long, steep climb. They're making lots and lots of money. But by... 2012, 2014, it starts to plateau. Revenue is slowing down. Google has pretty much made all the money they can from advertising. This has been going on for several years. You can look at Google's revenue. It's slowing down. The growth is slowing down. Google is really worried. Once that starts to drop, the investors are going to say, okay, that's it. It's over for Google. Goodbye. And they all walk off. And Google dropped really quickly. So Google has to make that revenue number go up every quarter. And they do that by putting more ads, more types of ads, more opportunities for advertising revenue in Google. It used to be there were three ads at the top and then links. Folks, go now to Google and search for anything that has money attached to it, like buy tickets, flight to Shanghai, flight to Paris, or whatever, a pair of ski boots. And you'll see the first four links are ads. And then the box from Google showing more ads, more links. And then finally, two-thirds of the way down, you might start seeing links to actual pages. So for SEO, for links from sites, they're basically not showing up at Google. If you're not in the first three or four links, you don't exist. And the first three or four links are all ads. Google is making as much money as they can before the game stops. 
what do you think is going to change then in this game? Because right now, Alexis and Siri and all these voice software programs are out there where there is no screen. There is no thing to choose from. What happens then? Ooh, it's a really, really difficult problem. We see this in Alexis, Apple Siri, Samsung has Bixby, the Chinese, a very Chinese-sized Taobao, and WeChat, all of them are developing voice search. Like I said, 80% of traffic to Google and to Facebook are on mobile. 40% of the searches at Google are now voice search, people talking to their phones. Some of you may know that two, three weeks ago, Google came out with an upgrade to their algorithm called BERT, B-E-R-T. Don't ask me what it stands for. Bidirectional something, transformational something, something, something. Some really obscure acronym, but Burke and Ernie from Sesame Street. What it does, it improves Google's ability to understand language. Before, Google looked at search queries, which you typed into Google, in one direction, from left to right, started the left of the screen, and it worked across word by word. So, for example, we go fishing at the bank. Google will see, we go fish bank. It simply looks at the nouns and verbs in the, in the sentence. But now BERT allows Google to look at each word one by one to the word to the left and right of it. So in We Go Fishing at the Bank, Google looks at the word fishing and looks to the right of it, bank, and to the left of it, go. And so Google now is able to understand sentences better. This is done through the Google search engine on desktop and mobile, but the real purpose is for voice search. People talk to their phones. On computers, we've learned to a series of, um, of keywords. We don't type in natural sentences. We type best fishing spot, San Francisco Bay. But when we talk to our phones, we say, hey, Google, where's the best place to go fishing? BERT allows Google to understand that better. So another issue is voice search for services. And Helen and I, Helen, my wife is Helen, we were fooling around with Google one night, asking silly questions to see what would happen. And I asked Google, Hey, Google, we need a plumber. Google said, okay, I can help with that. What do you need help with as a plumber? Unclog a drain, fix a faucet, fix the um, disposal unit, and so on. He gave me a choice of options. I clicked on unclog a drain. Google then said, is this for 4031 Park Boulevard, which is my address? Google knew my address because Google knew where my phone was, the Wi-Fi was connected to, and so on, via Google Maps. And so I said yes. And then Google said, would you like a call now, or would you like a list of plumbers? I click on call now, and a few seconds later, phone rings, a plumber answers, or rather, a plumber calls and says, hi, who tells me you're looking for a plumber to unclog a drain? When can I come over? Okay, that's great. One click, I get a plumber. I can talk to Google, pick up my phone, and ask for a plumber. That's really nice and convenient. However, there are 50 plumbers in Palo Alto. One plumber gets the call. What happened to the other 49? They do not get the call. And this is really bad for those 49 other plumbers. If they're not part of the Google service of voice search, they do not get calls. This is the Walmart effect. When Walmart comes to a town in the Midwest, when they open a store for 25 miles around in all directions, all the stores die. They're wiped out. And this is what's going to happen with this voice search. Last year, we had a VP from Google at a conference in charge. She was working with voice search, and we asked her, how can we optimize our clients for voice search? How can we get them listed to show up in voice search? And she said, we don't have information on that at this moment, but we'll let you know. That was a year and a half ago. Who is not telling us how to optimize for voice search? They're picking companies. They're choosing best customers and so on and optimizing them for voice search, and which means the little guys are not going to have this opportunity. Is there ever going to be a limit to how much it costs to put an ad on one of these search engines? There used to be a limit. Google used to have uh, four digits, 99.99. The maximum you could bid was $99.99, basically $100. But people began pushing for more and more and more, and Google raised that now to five digits, $999, basically $1,000. And what happens? CEOs, a bunch of macho guys, want to be ahead of the other macho guys. So they say, bid to the max. And so they bid $1,000. 
And so I've seen, I work with clients where they are indeed bidding $1,000 for a click. I mean, when you go to your search engine and you click on one of those links, the company is paying $1,000 for that click. It really does happen. We work with airlines and hotels, global airlines and hotels, where they were paying $400, $500 per click. But again, that's because they don't really understand Google AdWords. Google, of course, is perfectly happy to let them bid really high because they make so much money. But if you understand Google AdWords really well, and you understand the algorithm behind Google AdWords, then you can bid much lower and show up higher. I do this for clients where we bid as low as 25 cents. We show up above everybody else. Possibly do that. Andres, another question for you. All the big tech companies here, they're, they're competing for the best talent. And the ones that get these engineers, I'm guessing in the future will have a pretty good chance of survival, of growth. Where are the best students, the Stanford, the Berkeley, the MIT, those top engineers? What companies are getting them? Okay, first, I'm just trying to think about the computer science students. There is about, what, 200, 300 people at computer science at Stanford. And the same thing for Berkeley and MIT and so on. There's a, a few hundred students at each of these schools. Within Stanford, for example, they're separated in three categories. And this is not official. This is not on their ID card or anything. This is simply the way people see them. There's A, B, and C. A people are the superstars, the really hot shots. The Bs are very good. They're, comp they're very competent. And the Cs, of course, are just average computer science people. They're average students. The Cs do basically what we call copy pasta, which means they copy, paste, and then they edit the code. They're not original. They can handle code. They can look at code. They can edit the code, but they don't create code. The bees are better at that. The bees, you can say, hey, I need, a, I need a new process here to sort things, a new way of looking at a database to get information. The bees can do that. They can write original code that can work with databases, with information, and so on. The A's, however, and this is only a handful, you're talking about maybe 10% of the students are A's. The A's, they're highly original. They create new code. They write, they create entirely new languages. Python, Unix, that was created by A students. Those are the original people who go way out in the forest and build entirely new ideas. And what they build is what the B's and C's later work on. So these companies want, of course, the A's. However, the A's don't want to work at large established companies. Because A's realize the value of building a new computer language, the value of building an entirely new process. That's tremendous amounts of money there. We're talking about hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. No company could offer that in salary. Plus, worst part, if they go to work at a large company, they have to deal with bureaucracy, the internal politics. So when Google and Facebook and other companies come to Stanford and try to hire these students, they are waving not just suitcases, the waving truckloads of cash at the A students, but the A students simply will not go to Google or Facebook. That's, that's not challenging enough. What do you do at Google? Better advertising? That's not interesting. Write better, write code, to do more ads? They don't want to do that. So they go to companies like Palantir. And most of you are like, Palantir what? You've never heard of Palantir. Very few people I know have even heard the name. And when they hear the name, they know the name, ask them a follow-up question. What do they do? And they don't know. Very few people understand what Palantir does. It's a mega big data company. They handle data on a scale that's beyond extreme. They're looking at, for example, personal data of all people on the planet, 7 billion people. They're trying to organize that in gigantic databases so they can search and find correlations and trends, patterns in those 7 billion people. They're looking at data for all airlines, all air traffic worldwide. I think there's something like 20,000 flights every day in the U.S. If you add this up over a year, you have enormous amounts of data. So they're building software to handle all that and look for patterns and correlations that improve that. That's what Palantir does. That's a real challenge. That's an interesting challenge for these top-level students at Stanford, MIT, Berkeley, Northwestern, and other schools. And the salaries there, to follow up on that, are spectacular. You're talking about really large first-year salaries skyrocketing from there. 
these people will work at these companies for two or three years, and very likely after the third or fourth year, they're getting bonuses on the, not just six figures, seven figures, eight figure dollar bonuses. Emmy Rubin, for example, who worked on, I said, Android? No, on self-driving cars over at Google, got, I think, $90 million for one year or something like that. It's just spectacular numbers. They get. What they build, not worth $100 million, it's worth billions of dollars. That billion is in plural, uh, $5 billion, $10 billion, $20 billion. So these people understand the value of what they're building, and they're paid accordingly. So then, is there hope for the little guy in the future? Okay, folks, I really, really like working with the little guys, the, the mom and pop stores. I teach at a French university, and one of the French students heard me say mom and pop. He misunderstood that, and he said, these mama papa stores. <laughs> I really like that. So now I start using them, the mama papa sites. I really like working with the mama papa sites because there's so much you can do there, and you can see real changes. But the problem is, the little sites, and I'm talking about small sites under $5 million in revenue, they don't have the, the time, the money, or the resources to do this, this kind of the digital marketing. So they're pretty much out of luck. The optimal space for digital marketing is somewhere between $10 million, $50 million, up to around $900 million, a billion dollars. There, the sites are small enough that they have products. The websites are small enough with a few hundred pages. They can track all of that. They can track the sales, they can track the advertising and see what's going on. Once you get beyond that into the several billion dollar range and up to 20 billion, 40 billion. And yes, I work with a site that, I work with an organization that is, I think, at 400 billion. Once you get into that range, it's so large, so many pages, so complex, constantly evolving, that's impossible to track things. At one site, a $40 billion company, we had 5,000 websites with over 500,000 pages. And they were simply shifting so constantly every day, it was impossible to do conversion tracking. So at the low end, at the high end, think of the marketing is very difficult to do. In the mid-range, they worked really well. For the low end, Google started a solution a few years ago called Google My Business. So friends of mine, my wife is Chinese, and many of her friends are Chinese who have Chinese restaurants here in California, Texas, and so on. And they're talking with Helen, and they say, our restaurant doesn't show up in Google. He says, oh, you got to talk to Andreas. He knows Google. He knows SEO. So I look, and I see, of course, they don't show up in Google. The thing you do for them is set them up with Google My Business. So you type in your restaurant name, your business name, and so on, and then type after that, Google My Business. And then a page shows up where you can build an information box about your business. And it shows up on the right side of the page. So you look for many restaurants, especially large popular restaurants, on the right side of the page, you'll see a big box with pictures of the restaurant, map of the restaurant, phone numbers, websites, menus, time of day, all sorts of information about the restaurant. That's all Google My Business. It's free from Google. No cost, really easy to do, no code, no HTML. You can do it yourself. But, of course, there are people out there who tell companies that they'll set it up for $1,000 and maintain it every month for $500. No need to pay any of that. You can set it up yourself. So for the little guys, the mama papa sites, there's a really great solution called Google My Business. So then what companies or sectors are you very bullish on in the future? The, um, that ties into what I was doing here the last few days. Thursday and Friday, I was in China speaking at a conference on AI and IoT. Among all the other things I do, writing books and teaching at several schools here, I'm also the CMO for a startup. And we're building an IoT device that uses AI language translation tools. The IoT market is gigantic on a scale that people don't imagine. So they don't really see it. We see the web. We see pages. We, we use it on our phones. But we don't see much of IoT because it's small embedded chips in devices. And most of the devices are in your car, in your things in your house. You don't see that. You see the chip that's in your dog's collar, yes. But you don't see the dozens and dozens of IoT chips in your refrigerator and your car and so on. To get a sense of the scale, the IP address numbers was recently upgraded. For a long time, we had IP version 4, IP4, and that allowed around 4 billion IP addresses. And back then, <laughs> in 95, we thought that was more than enough. But now, we ran out of IP addresses. 
So now we have IP6. That is, the number is 3 times 10 to the 38. That is a gigantic number. That's greater than all the stars in the universe. To give you a better sense of that, 10 to the 18 is the number of sand grains on the planet Earth. University of Hawaii researchers a few years ago were laying on the beach in Hawaii, and of course, drinking beer or whatever, began talking about how much sand there is on Earth. And so they picked up a, a teaspoon of sand, counted all the sand grains in it, and then extrapolated to the planet Earth, and it finds 10 to the 18th. Double that is the number of IP addresses. We could have an IP address for every grain of sand on the planet Earth and another planet just as well. That's how many IT devices, IoT devices are coming. It's a gigantic market. If you look at the total revenues of the web for the last 20 years, it's somewhere around $2 trillion. Google, Facebook, and all the websites put together, they brought in about $2 trillion in revenue. IoT this year alone is $9 trillion, far bigger market than the web. But we don't see that because it's industrial, it's technical, it's all this background infrastructure stuff. <laughs> John is looking at me totally astonished at these numbers. <laughs> Well, I want you to go into more detail. I don't want you to stop. Keep going. <laughs> then there's AI. And by AI, we don't mean artificial intelligence. We mean machine learning, ML. You talk to anybody doing AI, that's what they're really doing is ML. At the conference, we spent two days looking at all sorts of presentations by companies on what they're developing, both in ML and IoT. Going back to what I said earlier about engineers optimizing, smaller, cheaper, and faster. If you embed IoT devices into everything for traffic, for example, or distribution of products, now you can track everything. For example, every water bottle could have its own chip in it, its own IoT chip in it, and then you can track every water bottle coming out of a company. Every stage of production, when it's made, when it's shipped, the stores it goes into, it gets recycled, all of that is trackable. And you're thinking, whoa, that's a lot of water bottles. But like I said, we can handle every grain of sand on the planet and still have many, many more IOP, IP addresses left over. So when you start tracking all of that, then you add machine learning to it. You start looking at patterns, big data. You start realizing where it's optimal to move your products. You start seeing maybe stop selling water bottles in Nebraska. Maybe this whole area doesn't sell very well. And there's other areas where it sells better, different uses of product. And then you start optimizing your entire supply chain all the way from production, shipping, the stores, use in the house, and so on. That means fewer people, smaller and cheaper, and faster. The production cycles get faster and faster and faster. The companies that right now are building hardware and products, any kind of product that doesn't have IoT built into it, these are companies that are going to shut down. They're going to die. Because out there, there are engineers trying to figure out how to put IoT devices into those products. And they're going after basically every possible market you can imagine, every possible product in the supermarket, at Home Depot, everywhere. All of that would be tracked. And those products function better than the old products, which means the new company rise up, take over, the old company disappear. It does make a lot of sense that if you can track the product, you can monitor it and you'd have all this more data that you could analyze to improve on the product. With that being said, though, the data and the security of the data, would people be concerned about it? Because if I bought a water bottle, the company's going to know I bought the water bottle. Oh, Even yes. though if I paid cash for it, it's tracking me. Think about what you pay cash for. In China, folks, move, going. I came back from China on Sunday, all right? This is what, Wednesday, Thursday? Nobody carries cash. Everything is done with digital payments. At the small fruit stand, you buy a pound of apples. The, the vendor holds up a cardboard, piece of cardboard with a QR code on it. You pick up your phone, you wave it at the QR code, you make the transaction. Everywhere I went, restaurants, stores, uh, the metro, on the trains, everything was done with QR codes and digital payments. So right now, you may be paying with cash coins, but very soon you'll be paying digital. But again, there's no reason why we cannot embed IoT into uh, cash itself, into dollar bills, and into coins as well. So you can start tracking every piece of finance. Every transaction would be trackable. 
I have no doubt within a few years that, that will be done. The question about security, the problem is that many of these companies, they move really fast, they build things, and they don't pay much attention to the security. Many of you have seen, they'll use the same password on everything. Many uh, routers, for example, in homes, all use the same default password. That's a really big problem because that means these IoT devices are hackable. Imagine hundreds of thousands of refrigerators could be hacked and all sorts of things could be done with those. That's a big problem. It's a, um, eventually, company will begin realizing they have to improve their security, either better passwords or different systems, different ways of handling passwords. Another issue is the users themselves. The users should be changing passwords. But as I've seen, the vast majority of users do not change passwords. They don't know how. So many times I go to people's homes where the routers are still the default router name. I'm sure they're using the default passwords. That's a huge problem. Andreas, you travel the world giving talks on many different topics. Do you see any continents or regions that are falling behind or really accelerating and that you're excited or bullish about in the next five years? It's a very mixed bag now. In some places, things are moving forward very quickly. Other places are standing still in different industries. A very good friend of mine was here in Silicon Valley, built a startup, and then went to England in London to run a um, large a accelerator. And she said that, I asked her about it, she said London is pretty much five years behind Silicon Valley. Then you go to Denmark, Scandinavia, they're five years ahead in digital payments and so on. Denmark, for example, has a digital account for every citizen. They no longer send postal mail to people in Denmark. It's all done digital online. France, you pay for the metro in Paris, all digital with your cell phone. We don't have that here in Silicon Valley. Africa, which is astonishing. Every quarter or so, every three months, I lead in-person seminars for EMBAs from Africa. We're talking Ghana, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, and so on. West Africa, from Nigeria up to Tunisia, Algeria. People do not realize this. There are 10,000 startups in Africa now. There are over 100 AI startups in Africa now. They're leapfrogging ahead so quickly because most people do not have desktop computers, so they go straight to mobile. Most people don't have banks or credit cards, they went straight to digital payments on mobile. In Kenya, for example, they developed a digital payment solution that works extremely well. I think something like 70% of the population now uses. They do their banking on their cell phone. They got their cell phone number is their bank account number. Other areas see that and start trying to develop that. In Mexico, People began developing that, and the credit card company got, became afraid that, if, whoa, if that catches on, we'll never be able to sell credit cards in Mexico. So Visa, I think six months ago, announced a free credit card to everyone in Mexico. What they're trying to do is head off this kind of mobile payment systems. In other areas in South America, Chile, Argentina, there's lots of startup activity going on. These companies that are starting in Africa, South America, they may have the resources as here in Silicon Valley. What are their chances of surviving and growing, going global? It's a, it's a, it sounds unbelievable, but there are, I think there's two or three unicorns in Africa now. Startups are over a billion dollars, and there's more and more. The situation for them is very challenging. To put the way they use that word, they cannot copy Silicon Valley. A group of uh, VCs went to India several years ago, and they thought, Oh, great, we'll, build, we'll simply build Silicon Valley in India. And they took all the methods from Silicon Valley, from venture capital, and set up shopping in India. Three years later, the whole thing shut down. It didn't work. You can't take Silicon Valley and duplicate it in India or Africa or China or even France. There are the local conditions. There's difficulties. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, which Americans call the Ivory Coast, in Cote d'Ivoire, they don't have street addresses. Houses in villages don't have the streets don't have names, the houses don't have numbers. Instead, the post carrier for each village, he knows every person in that village. So if you want to do shipping to these villages, you need to be aware that there are people in the village that will carry your pack to the house. So if you want to set up your own distribution, you cannot rely on sending packages with street numbers and addresses on it. You need to set up your own person in each village with a motorcycle delivering packages. 
Silicon Valley company, don't understand that. If you live in Paris, you know, health numbers in Paris, pretty, uh, pretty chaotic. They're not, they don't follow the American system. So you have to know that, understand how it works on the street. Same thing with India. I wrote a book about startups, and in the book, I interviewed people in startups around the world, not just in Silicon Valley. I interviewed people in France, Colombia, Mexico, Denmark, Africa, China, India, and so on. And they talked about that, that they started small and very carefully grew and tested things. And they slowly discovered what works here doesn't work there, and so on. So you're seeing a very pragmatic, very practical, hands-on way of solving these startup issues. The cool thing is they come here to Silicon Valley, learn from here, see what's going on, learn about new models and so on, and then they go back and see how they can apply that, how they can develop that agile for their markets and so on. Many of these startups in China and Europe are actually agiles that were started first here in Silicon Valley, but then were adapted to conditions in those countries. Do you have any advice out there for investors that might be looking at Silicon Valley companies and tech in the future? Maybe how to analyze companies or things to think about before they make that trade? Yes, they have to be really careful. There are many startups which are not really startups. They're there to raise a great deal of money, take your money, have a lot of fun for two or three years, and then they disappear. There are a lot of investors who major investors round up money from other investors, put out their own money, and then crash the company. We see that with um, WeWork, for example. WeWork says it should definitely not be worth $40 billion or whatever it was worth several weeks ago. They are not really a tech company. They're just an office rental company. But they managed to convince people that it was a Silicon Valley thing, and these naive investors came in put up a great deal of money. There's a number of these companies like that where very, some people we call sophisticated, other people call unscrupulous. Large investors know that they can bring in a great deal of money from naive investors. You have to be very careful about that. Find people who've been here a long time. Find people who you can trust. Find people who are considered part of the Silicon Valley community, who are respected and trusted by other people in Silicon Valley, and then work with them. If they are investing their own money into your company, then you can do a partial investment along with them. If you see that someone put up, for example, $100,000 into a startup, then you can put in maybe $25,000, $50,000 along with them. They're taking the lead. They're doing the due diligence. They understand what's going on, and then you don't have to follow so closely. Due diligence is difficult to do because it's complex, especially with technical issues. It becomes so technical, so complex, really hard to understand. If you're not deeply involved in the technology and what's going on in that field, you have no idea if it's something that's growing, plateaued, or is collapsing. So you need to be working with people who understand the field. What about for publicly traded companies? Is there any type of research or mindset or advice you can give people that are trying to catch that company right before it figures out actually how to make a profit? or they're making a profit now that might not be there tomorrow? That's hard for me to answer because, folks, to be really honest here, I've become very skeptical, very cynical about companies because I've, I've been here so long. I've seen so much fraud and scandals in companies, which you see in public, in the Wall Street Journal, in Fortune magazine, and then with reality inside the company. That's totally different. Friends of mine work at companies, and they tell me, oh, my God, the whole thing is about to crash. But in public, they're on the page of Fortune and Money Magazine. They're on the cover. Everybody thinks it's a great company. The very best example is Taranos with Elizabeth Holmes. For three or four years, they were the superstar. People really thought, and I'm talking about the Wall Street Journal, Fortune Magazine, and other people, they really thought that Elizabeth Holmes was the next Steve Jobs. At one point, she was worth, I think, $6 billion. Her company was bringing in major investors from all over the world. The board of directors was a spectacular array of people. But it turned out the whole thing was basically fake. The product never did not work, never worked. Actually, in theory, could not work. Professors at Stanford from the very beginning told Elizabeth Holmes, Paranoss, this will never work. 
It simply cannot work the way, the way you think it should. But they ignored those professors, went ahead and brought in money. So a lot of, a lot of people lost a great deal of money there. Why that happens, the venture capitalists and the large venture capital companies have found that they can bring in a great deal of money from other people. We call it opium. They are basically um, working on opium. By that, that means OPM, other people's money. They're not risking their own money. They're putting in, at most, by law, they're obligated to put in 1% of the funds just to keep them honest. But 1% is nothing to them. So the other 99% is other people's money. Whether a company succeeds or collapses, that's not really their problem. The VCs make 2%. Either way, success or collapse, so the VCs are making money anyway, no matter what happens. And that explains why you see things like Juicero, a $70 million startup to make a machine that you push a button and it squirts out a glass of juice. Folks, you can buy a $2 glass juicer and squeeze your own oranges by hand. It works just as well and maybe even better. But they raised $70 million and so a $700 juice machine. Of course, a year later, the whole thing collapsed. But for that time, a bunch of people made a lot of money. Andreas, great information. Thank you for your time today on Silicon Valley. If anyone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about what you're doing, what is the best way to reach you and go about doing that? Like you pointed out the first, I was here at the very beginning. And way back then, a bunch of us, we, we set up our own websites. Of course, I registered my name, Andreas. So, andreas.com is my website. And my email address is andreas at andreas.com. Some of you want to send me email via Gmail, and I also have a Gmail address, gmail at andreas.com. And folks, you're welcome to email me, uh, ask any questions you want about Silicon Valley or whatever. I always answer all emails, so I'm happy to, to reply back. And I also would like to thank Sean for the opportunity to be here. It's a lot of fun to talk about Silicon Valley, about the things that are going on here. Once again, thank you for your time. Everyone at home. All of Andres' information will be in the show notes. So go to the Investors Podcast and check out Silicon Valley and the information will be there. Thank you for listening. And next week, we'll have another great episode. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.